Good afternoon, or actually good morning. It's still morning, and you can continue eating and gathering your lunch. I'm Dr. Veronica Wilkerson Johnson, University of Michigan Office of the Vice President for Government Relations. And in tandem with the UM Office of Alumni Relations, the Alumni Association, we are so excited that you have joined us today to learn about a very, very important issue, a crisis in the state of Michigan, but certainly one that we are wanting to change and improve. So we have an amazing panel here today to present to you. And we like to think at the Wolverine Caucus that we're helping to change the world one forum at a time. So thank you again for being here. And I am so honored to have the opportunity to introduce the Honorable Kira Clemente, who is state representative of the 14th district downriver. And she is on the health policy committee and is certainly committed to helping in legislation that will improve the opioid epidemic in Michigan. So without further ado, here's State Representative Kara Clemente. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like Veronica said, I do represent District 14, which is in the Down River communities of Lincoln Park, Riverview, Melvindale, and Wyandotte. And I'm very honored to be here today because I have been uh, this is my second term, and in my first term, I was asked by one of my judges to come to our drug task force and witness what's going on in our Dharma River communities with opioids. And through that, we were able to start a FAN chapter, which is Families Against Narcotics in the Dharma River area. And I also um, have taken some training on Narcan. It is something that is reaching all of us, no matter where you come from, what type of education background you have, because of uh, prescriptions that uh, people are getting their hands on. And it's very scary. I am a proud mom of two Michigan students, one in Ann Arbor who will be graduating in May, and another one at the University of uh, Michigan in Dearborn. And I am always wanting to make sure that I know what's going on with my children, my communities, and to help in any way. So the legislation that we passed last year, I think, is helping um, our physicians um, have relationships with their patients and making sure that these types of prescriptions are only being used when really, really needed. So today, I would like to introduce our uh, speaker, Dr. Chad Brummett. He is an associate professor of anesthesiologist, and he's the co-director of the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. Um, and I think that's all it says. I need my glasses. Great. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, on behalf of the co-speakers, I, I, I really appreciate you all coming out. This is a, a, an incredible uh, turnout for this event. I know this is a, a issue that affects all of you both in your community, probably personally. I think when you have a size, an audience of this size, we know that many of you have been personally affected by opioids. Um, before we get into the agenda, I will draw attention. Um, uh, thankfully, with our, our SAMHSA SOR funding, we've actually been able to pull together what's going to be a, an incredible event, um, May 10th in Ypsilanti, uh, together with Harvard, the University of Michigan president and the Harvard president came together and said we want to do work around a couple of big topics, one opioids and one poverty, sort of separate approaches. And uh, this will be our first symposium. We will follow this up by another symposium in Boston. Uh, we are really pleased that Admiral Brett Girard, the Assistant Health and Human Services Secretary, will be there to provide the keynote. And I will tell you, among the speaker list, some of whom will be just placed on panels, we have about 10 other keynote speakers. We really have world leaders in the opioid epidemic. And so for those that um, are of you in the room, we are, are really changing the way that we approach this conference. This is not going to be a traditional medical conference. We're trying to put this as a thought of policy to practice, really targeting policy makers, um, public health officials, and those in the community and payers. And so I hope you or your staff will be able to attend the event. It will be free. It's going to be an incredible day. 
So I'm going to pivot and, and introduce our speakers today. Uh, we're going to think about and talk about opioids maybe in a different way than you've classically thought about it. Um, we know that most of the narrative, most of the conversation today, appropriately so, is on heroin deaths, fentanyl deaths, and all of the addiction and dependence in our community. And I think these are important concepts. We know in Michigan we have about five of our residents die every day. Nationally, it's about 130 deaths per day. When I started doing my lecture about five, uh, about three years ago, I only said 78 deaths per day, and this just keeps going up. And I, I think the reality is, even with appropriate prescribing, because so many of the people that are moving to heroin and fentanyl are so far down that pathway, we know that that, that increase in overdose is likely to continue for at least a short period of time before it starts to return back the other way. I want to be sure, though, that everybody remembers that this problem is a physician problem, it is a provider problem, it is a problem of prescribers. In the end, the underpinnings of this epidemic are prescribing. And while we're seeing improvements in prescribing, we had a great conversation with Kim Gatica from the licensing board earlier. The state of Michigan has seen improvement in prescribing. But really, if you look at it, we're still probably prescribing more than a bottle to every adult. So while it feels like we're going in the right direction, we still have a long way to go. And when we look at many of the metrics by which states are assessed, we lag behind other states. And we are, unfortunately, one of those states that when the map of the US is shown and darker colors are bad, we are one of the shade states that's shaded a bit darker. So I, I really hope that everybody will come together today to realize that we still have a lot of work yet to do. But today, I think we're going to show you some really practical solutions and some of the work that's happening in our state together in partnership with our state health department and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and the University of Michigan. Now, Mike Inglesby is going to lead us off today. He is a, a uh, professor of transplant surgery and also directs education for our medical school. After Mike Inglesby is going to be Ramesh Dalia. Ramesh it directs the uh, education for our dental school, so clinical education. So you have the clinical educators, the people running the clinical education for both our medical school and our dental school here today. And then Rebecca Hafaji is an assistant professor of public health, who really is the country's foremost expert on PDMP. She's going to blush when I say that, but honestly, if you look up prescription drug monitoring program, our MAPS program, um, and you search that in New England Journal of Medicine, you'll find Rebecca Hafaji. She's frequently called upon to talk about PDMPs. And so Hopefully today we can help you think about prescribing and prevention and maybe some tangible solutions that we're doing throughout our state, but that also have next level work associated. So with that, I'll introduce Mike. Great, thanks Chad. Um, can everyone hear us okay? All right, great, I'll, uh, I'll talk loud. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, Chad and I have been partners on this problem for about three years, so my my day job is I do liver transplants, and um, anyone knows anything about transplant, there's kind of two parts to the job. One, one surgeon goes and gets the organs, the other surgeon kind of puts them in. Um, actually, I did two this weekend, and both were opioid overdoses. But really, what got me kind of, I guess, engaged, so Chad uh, has been an expert in pain for, for a long time. As a transplant surgeon, I didn't know much about pain, but I had this weekend three or four years ago where I was on donor call. So you go to these hospitals and you do these procurements. And uh, the Gift of Life of Michigan, which is the organization that runs this, started a policy of telling kind of the donor story before these operations. And as a surgeon, you know, it doesn't usually scratch the surface too much. You're doing a job just like we all have our jobs to do. Um, but I had three in a row and um, three young women. One was like 16. The oldest one was probably like 22. And the story was, you know, sports injury, opioids, overdose. Next one was like dental extraction, um, after wisdom tooth extraction, opioids and overdose. And the third one was a student I remember most vividly who um, had their high school graduation and they experimented with alcohol and some pills someone brought and overdosed. Um, this was like literally in about a 24 hour period. And um, it still didn't totally scratch the surface, but I was traveling on the way home from one of them. One of the medical students um, kind of started asking me questions, nothing about, you know, the anatomy of the hepatic artery or any of the stuff that I think I usually focus on in these settings, but really about the stories of these donors. And, um, and it, it, it made me pause. I showed thereafter reached out to Chad and another colleague, Jen Walji, 
who's a plastic surgeon, and uh, the three of us have been working in this group called Michigan Open for about three years, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of how we think we've made some progress in our state. Um, so when you think about the opioid epidemic, we all immediately think about the patient who overdoses on opioids, like the three patients I just mentioned. But really, no one kind of wakes up one morning and starts using heroin. They're introduced to opioids by someone like me or Chad or Ramesh, you know, clinicians who write for opioids. And I never really pondered my own practices around um, prescribing opioids. But what we've learned through our work is that the vast majority, almost all of people who go on to use um, things like heroin and at risk of uh, overdose got their initial exposure to opioids by a physician, almost 90% of patients. Um, and, uh, and that's a devastating number to know that some of my patients potentially, you know, I, I took out their kidneys so they could donate to someone, but they're, they're a totally healthy person. I gave them opioids, and some patients really struggle to ever stop those opioids once exposed. If you hear stories, um, if you hear stories uh, from people who uh, use kind of heroin for long periods of time, they're trying to regain that first exposure to opioids. It changed their life forever, um, and I think we as dentists and physicians um, certainly are at the cutting edge of this epidemic. And physicians don't necessarily like to hear that. We as physicians clearly have ratcheted up our prescribing over the years. We're writing for more and more pills. And we were doing that for various reasons. It wasn't ill-intentioned. We thought it was good for patients. We don't want to leave patients in pain. But our work has shown clearly that the only thing that bottle of pills I give you after surgery determines is how many pills you take. So if I took out Chad's gallbladder and I gave him five pills, he'll probably take two or three. If I gave him 75 pills, he'd probably take 20 or 30. If you take, if you take a whole bottle of 75 pills over the course of a week, you're going to have withdrawal. So what happens is I operate on someone, they take all the pills, and then at, when they're done their pills, they feel really, really, really bad. And the only thing that really makes them feel better is more pills. And then they're kind of off to the races, so to speak. And that could be essentially what we surgeons consider a successful outcome surgically, but these patients are never the same. And I think it's that awareness that's fundamentally um, kind of how we focus on this. So this is a paper, or two papers we wrote, that basically shows that the number of pills that a physician gives you after a procedure really determines um, not your pain control or not kind of are you going to call for a refill because doctors we give a lot of pills we don't want to you know have to deal with people calling for refills but really determine the only thing that really matters is basically how many pills you take so the concept underlying this is what we call new persistent opioid use so vast majority of patients are opioid naive they come to see a practitioner we expose them to opioids and they become a new persistent user. So what is this number? I'm going to draw your attention to this slide. This is a paper we wrote. This is our, we write a lot. We're academics. We write lots of papers. I think this is our most impactful paper. And what does this mean? 6%. Those people have like colon surgery, gallbladder surgery, thyroid surgery. These are normal kind of routine operations done on well people. 99% of patients make a full recovery after this operation. Well, 6% basically means among the opioid naive patients, people come in well, 6% of them long term leave the surgical journey taking opioids every day. If you look at other types of surgery, orthopedic surgery, it's 8%. Hand surgery, 13%. Spine surgery, 13%. Those things make sense. But here's a devastating number. Children, adolescents who have surgical care, about 5% of them long-term continue to take opioids after the surgical journey. And then patients with cancer, it kind of makes sense that um, we as physicians, we've shown right from our opioids for patients who have cancer, about 10% of those patients. And I think another really scary number is women who have bad breast cancer who get surgical care, get reconstruction, and they're, most women, as we know, survive breast cancer these days. But upwards of 20%, despite survival, continue to take opioids every day after all they've been through. So I think it's fair to say we can kind of do better. We, we wrote these papers, and um, it became clear that um, there was a miss, there was a, an opportunity to essentially take better care of patients. Um, so this is a, a little study that we did that was done by a medical student. And um, he basically counted up so, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, taken out of gallbladder. It's one of the most common, I think it's the third most common procedure done in the United States. You come in, I could take out your gallbladder. Feel like I could take out your gallbladder in an hour, you go home the same day, and um, we have you back to work, so to speak, probably in two or three weeks. 
It's a relatively minor surgical procedure. And we looked at, uh, just at the University of Michigan, it's a good hospital, we'd like to think. Um, and we asked, you know, when we take out people like Bill's gallbladder, how many pills do we give them? I think the number is about 45 pills. It's a lot of pills, but, you know, that's kind of what our practice was. Um, and then we called people like Bill, and we called a couple hundred people and said, how many did you take? And Bill only took six of the pills. So who's ever had a procedure and had leftover pills? Almost everyone. Now, some patients take every pill. That number is about 6%. That's the previous study. But most patients have a lot of leftover pills. So there's this disconnect between what people like me are writing for and what patients like Bill are taking. So essentially, a lot of the work we've been doing over the past two or three years in the state of Michigan is to kind of close that gap, to try to take best care of Bill, but at the same time, make sure we don't overprescribe for Bill, put him at risk for chronic opioid use, or for that matter, the pills being left in his home, which is a whole other uh, problem. So basically, what we started doing at the University of Michigan, say, all right, instead of 50, we'll give 15. We're kind of like the Soviet Union in some ways, the University of Michigan. We have, a, we have a one boss, and he says, we will now give 15 pills, and it immediately changed. No one's gotten 16, no one's gotten 14. Last two and a half years, <laughs> surgical residents are very good at following orders. We give 15 pills. Um, and what we found is now people are taking four pills, and we had no increase. No patients can continue to, you know, that small number continued to call for refills, but it didn't change at all. Patient reported pain. So the reason we feel strongly that a lot of these changes need to be driven by doctors, dentists, and physicians is because it's always patient first. We need to take care of the patients, and that's, I think, what mo we do for a living. We talk to patients all day, every day, and we make sure they're getting optimal care. We noticed that patients didn't report worse, um, worse outcomes, and they took even fewer patient pills. Now we're down to about one pill. We continue to make progress on this, so when people come, like Bill come in, about half of them go through things like a lap coli without needing opioids, still reporting excellent pain care. On average, patients take about one pill. And we give now that only about four pills. So we've really kind of ratcheted down prescribing at our own institution. But where we're lucky is we have these remarkable partnerships in the state with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, that give us a platform. We really do feel at the University of Michigan that we serve the state. We had this little experiment on Bill, where we improved his care. What can we do to kind of expand this across the state? So um, I run this group, the Michigan Surgical Quality Collaborative. It's a collaborative of 70 hospitals across the state, funded by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan. And we're all about making surgery in Michigan the safest and best in the country. We took essentially that little experiment I described and came up with very specific recommendations for the common operations done in the state. So we're in 70 hospitals. We know. How many pills surgeons give? We know how many pills patients take. We try to have them meet in the middle and develop recommendations on how many pills you should have. So if you've had surgery in the last year, hopefully your surgeon followed these recommendations. And we've been able to tie these with um, financial incentives from Blue Cross. And these have, um, these have taken off kind of well. And we started with kind of easy stuff like lap coli and, and working our way to harder things like orthopedic surgery and dental care. Um, and uh, so this is opioid prescribing across the MSQC, that collaborative of hospitals in the state of Michigan. We started talking about this in January 2017. And just by talking about it, we started to have an impact. This is how many pills surgeons are giving. So the, the numbers here, they're in oral morphine equivalents. It's about 55 pills is what we started out in the average operation. And just by talking about it, we made some progress. But then we released our recommendations, and this is, you know, as of about six months ago in the state of Michigan, prescribing after surgery is down about 50-55%, 50, which is significant progress. We're very proud of this because it's really hard to change physician practice. You kind of have to, um, you kind of have to be a surgeon to have a surgeon listen to you. Um, we've learned that lesson, um, and we continue to build a network so that, you know, you have to be a dentist to get dentists to, to listen to you, et cetera, et cetera. Most importantly, across the state of Michigan, patient satisfaction or patient-reported pain has not changed. So patients are getting the same good care. We're writing for half as many pills as we were recently. So there's two evil dark sides to overprescribing. One is, you know, patients like Chad getting stuck on opioids. The other one is patients like Bill, who we give them a bottle of pills and they're left in his home. And then someone comes into his home to paint his house, to mow his lawn, to babysit his grandchildren and those pills are in your home. And those pills in homes, as we all know, can have a devastating impact on our communities. So Chad talked to a local 
uh, high school in Ann Arbor and asked the high school kids, how many of you can get your hands on opioids in the next hour or two? And the vast majority raised their hand. These pills are everywhere in our community. So within that context, a lot of the work that we've been doing is essentially doing opioid take back. So uh, Chad started these about two years ago. Is that about right, Chad? And we started off kind of one in Ann Arbor. And we worked our way up to eight sites in seven counties. The next one had 27 sites, and then most recently 62 sites. Um, and we uh, are in, these, this is the map, this is uh, where we've done these things. And what we have is, and Nicole's in the back, she kind of runs this for us. So Nicole, we have uh, essentially a, this is how you do an opioid drop, because there's a lot of rules around, you have to have law enforcement present. Doesn't work if it's at a law enforcement establishment, it has to be in a community space, like a high school or a church, or, a hospital where people want to go, they bring their pills, um, and we dispose of them. So it's been successful. Just over these, we've gotten over 6,500 pounds of pills out of the state of Michigan. Unfortunately, there's probably tenfold that more still left in our communities, but nonetheless, it's significant progress. Um, if you want to get involved, if we somehow inspire you, this is potentially a space within your community. Um, we are around. You can ask us. We can facilitate this as Nicole has done for right, this rapid expansion. Um, and this is where we would love to go. These are counties, these dark blue counties, where we don't have pill drops that are particularly hard hit by the opioid epidemic. If you have any uh, pull or access there, we would love to partner with you. And we will pay for it. Yes. So um, I have one or two more slides. This is essentially a thank you to Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We have absolutely changed the way surgical care is done in the state of Michigan. We are the role model um, for the country when it comes to acute prescribing after surgical care. It's because of these Blue Cross funded collaboratives around surgical specialties, anesthesia um, in our state. Um, and then we, Michigan Open, uh, essentially only exists because of the, of the generosity of these funding providers, many of whom are here today. Um, we think we've done good by the people in the state of Michigan. I, I am sure everyone in this room's care, hopefully you don't need surgery, but if you do, um, is going to be different than it would have been a year ago in the state. We're proud of that, but we still have a lot of work to do. Because, as I said, I did two liver transplants this weekend. They were still both opioid overdose donors. So we have work to do, but I think we're making progress, um, and we're proud of our work. So thank you, Chad. The mic working? Okay. Hi everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Ramesh. Um, firstly, I definitely want to acknowledge uh, Michigan Open and all that they've done. Uh, the work that we've accomplished in dentistry is led, supported, uh, and and um, partnered with by Michigan Open. Chad Brummett, Mike Englesby, Jen Wilder, who's not here, and also Rebecca Hafferty has helped. So it's been a very collaborative uh, effort in the, in the dental world. So um, I'm still a practicing dentist. So m most of my time is at the university, but I still practice dentistry. I'm a general dentist. And I want to tell you about, sorry, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so I've got to be louder. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so, um, now, where was I? Just totally ruined my talk. No, no. <laughs> just kidding. So, so um, in in so I'm a general dentist, and I, I just want to share with you three lessons that I've learnt from our research, which informs my position that we can eliminate opioids from dental practice. Okay. So, there's only three points I'm going to make. Easy to remember. So, number one is dentists prescribe a lot, and before our work, that was not well known or acknowledged. And number two, that Opioids actually don't improve patient satisfaction in the context of pain management. And lastly, that opioids aren't that effective for dental pain anyway. Okay? So, so firstly, I think this is the most beautiful and uh, happy extraction patient I've ever seen. Uh, but anyway, the, the first study that we did was a big database study using the market scan database. So this is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it is basically an insurance database, and it has information from about 50 million individuals across this country, every state in this country. And so we pulled out all those people who had a wisdom tooth extraction. And then we looked at people who had, never, had not previously 
had an opioid. So the dentist introduced them to opioids. Okay? And so we, we found, we found that actually uh, your odds of becoming a persistent opioid user, like Dr. Englesby described, was 2.7 times if you fit this profile. You've never been introduced to opioids and you came to the dentist and had your wisdom teeth out. Because who is having their wisdom teeth out? It's, it's teens and, and 20s, it's young people, and that's a very vulnerable population. Uh, and you'll see this number, 78%, and that is that 78% of people who had their wisdom teeth out had an opioid prescription. And you might say, well, 78, that's not close to 100, so that's not too bad. Problem is, every year in America, so I'll, I'll just repeat that, every year in America, dentists take out about 3 to 4 million wisdom teeth. So this is about this is about two million people. And suddenly seventy eight percent getting a prescription is the problem. Okay, so now I want to tell you, you know, so we did this big data study and then what we realized is we need finer detail. We need more detail. We need to be speaking to these patients. So the next project we did was we called back all our patients who had extractions at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and we wanted to understand their experience. So, this first part is just looking at routine extractions, basic extractions. So if you went, if you had orthodontics, you may have had an extraction. That's what this is, this is a basic extraction, not surgical, not impacted teeth. So what we found is that of all the pills that were prescribed, there was actually only about 53% used by patients. So 47% were went into that, into that reservoir of drugs that we were talking about where they were, they were unused. And it's actually not that different for uh, surgical extractions. So it's about 45% excess. The thing here is almost immediately we can cut prescribing in half. But I really think we can go further than that. I think we can almost eliminate prescribing of opioids in dentistry. Am I doing okay with folks hearing me? Okay. <clears throat> I also have a foreign accent. I don't know if you noticed that. <clears throat> um, so now the, the next thing is we, we were, so we were speaking with these patients on the phone, asking them how many pills did they use and that kind of thing. And then we, asked, we also asked them to, to speak about their satisfaction with patient care. We got them to rate their patient satisfaction. Okay? And so on the left is routine extractions and on the right is surgical. The orange is the opioid group, the blue is the non-opioid group. There's actually no significant difference whether you had an opioid or, or did not have an opioid in satisfaction. This is really powerful for a dentist. It's, it, the, th the thing is, you know, um, let me tell you a little bit about our profession, right? So 60% of dentists are in solo practice, right? So that's a small business, a very small business. And actually, only 8% of dentists in this country work in, a, in, an, in an operation with 20 or more practitioners. So 92% are in 19 or less. These are small businesses, right? And so you know, I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything like that, but just to paint a picture, dentists have a lot more in common with a restaurant business owner than the CEO of a hospital. Okay? And so this is someone on Yelp saying that Yelp ruined his business because, of, because two or three patients started ranting negatively on Yelp. Right? And truthfully, dentists could be worried about this, this experience, because it's a small business. And there's a line in here which you may not be able to see, but basically said it's really scary that a lot of my customers don't even give me a chance because they read the Yelp review and it was negative. And that's what dentists are worried about too. And I can tell you, I'm guilty of this too. Because when you're writing a prescription for opioids, one thing you're thinking is I kind of want, I want to be conservative. I don't want my patient to be uncomfortable. But also, for my own livelihood and the well-being of my business, I don't want patients to be uncomfortable. Right, so it's a very challenging environment for to ask dentists to reduce their opioid prescribing. But our study finding is very liberating because actually we've shown that patient satisfaction is, is there's no difference whether you prescribe opioids or not. So that should be very. I think that's the most important thing that we've shown. Okay. So anyway, we asked them another question. We asked them to rate their pain experience. Okay. And so the top is routine extractions, the bottom is surgical extractions, the orange is again the group that received opioids and the blue did not receive opioids. Now you'll see that as we go to the right of screen, so pain rating is higher as you go right of screen. As you go right of screen, 
there's more and more orange bars because actually the patients with opioids reported worse pain. Okay, they reported worse pain. So to some of you this may be a surprise, but actually while we were doing this study, so while in 2018, while we were working on this study, another study came out that really uh, confirmed and supported what we said. And th this, this was published in the middle of last year, 2018, and what it basically said is for dental pain, so it's very specific, and it may not be generalizable to other disciplines, but for dental pain, a thousand milligrams of acetaminophen plus 400 milligrams of ibuprofen is actually more effective than any opioid mix for dental pain. Okay, and our study confirms this because the patients having opioids are actually reporting worse pain, right? So, there's three points that I make, right? One is the dentists do prescribe a lot, and they actually prescribe to a very vulnerable group young people, young people who are opioid naive, right? Uh, the second thing is that there's no significant difference in the satisfaction of patients, whether they receive an opioid for their pain management or not. And the third thing is, for dental pain, the patients receiving opioids actually, receive, uh, actually rated their pain as worse. And so because of these three things, I truly believe we can eliminate opioids from dentistry. Now, it's true that there may be some cases where there is severe pain and the patient may have may not be able to consume a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, but that is less common. And rather than being the first line of defense, this can definitely be something that's, I guess, in our repertoire for prescribing, but only gone to in, in rare cases and not the routine upfront approach to, uh, to pain management. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. My name is Rebecca Hafaji, as Chad so nicely introduced me. Um, and this is my first trip to Lansing, so that is fun for me. I've been in Michigan uh, almost three years now. Uh, and I am a lawyer and a health policy researcher. Um, in a former life, I used to practice law, so I love get, getting into the details of the laws and thinking about what effects they have on um, both prescribing in this context and then also health outcomes. Um, I also should say um, I'm a member of the Injury Prevention Center at University of Michigan um, and an active faculty member there. It's one of 10 CDC-funded injury prevention centers across the country. Uh, we do great work um, and a lot in the opioid prescribing context and focus a little more on the overdose outcome as well because we really care about the injuries or, you know, or end up including non-fatal overdoses too that people um, have from this epidemic. So I'm going to talk today about what states are doing to address uh, the opioid crisis, um, and whether those policies are working. Uh, that's a lot of what uh, I research, um, and I focus in on prescription drug monitoring programs specifically. Um, so lots of different levels at which policymaking is happening here, and one of the things that as an evaluator that's so challenging is separating them out and figuring out which ones are having the effect and, and how do we independently evaluate these things. Um, and states are just one level. The federal government's been doing a lot, um, particularly recently, uh, and the states and localities and things like drug take-back programs and all these sorts of things. So it's all this big puzzle piece, that's a puzzle that's like coming together. Um, but I focus in on state policies. Uh, and this graph shows you um, some of the prominent state policies that have been adopted as of late. So to give you a sense, there's been about 1,300 bills that have been introduced around opioids from 2010 to 2016 across the states, 500 of which have been enacted. So very busy policy making space. A lot of them have been in these domains. Uh, so I'll unpack these a little bit. The first is naloxone access laws. Uh, that's in blue. These are, Michigan has one. Um, these are laws that uh, provide more robust access to naloxone, the op opioid overdose reversal drug or antidote. Uh, that is highly effective when administered uh, in a timely fashion. Um, and so those really picked up as of 2012 or so, and then have um, almost all states have them now, uh, or actually all states, excuse me. Uh, and then another is the PDMPs, or Prescription Drug Monitoring Programs. Um, that uh, was already popular in 2007, but has um, 49 states have them now, so virtually all um, except Missouri, which now is introducing it for the seventh time in a bill and may indeed pass it this year. Uh, those are electronic systems that analyze, store, and monitor controlled substance 
uh, dispensing information uh, and provide a really complete picture of what a patient is getting across the state. Sometimes states communicate with each other and prescribers, pharmacists, law enforcement officers, medical boards typically all have access to these data. Um, the, the third and is um, Good Samaritan laws, that's shown in gray. Similar to naloxone access, those have enjoyed a precipitous increase since about 2012 or so. Uh, those are laws that provide uh, legal protections uh, when somebody calls 911 or an emergency authority in the case of an overdose um, and so feels protected in doing so, uh, that they won't get um, sanctioned. Um, and then finally, uh, pain clinic laws in yellow um, those, about 11 states have them now, and those are laws that more strictly regulate uh, pain management clinics where their main book of business is treating pain, uh, so only, mostly chronic pain, um, and both the diagnosis and the treatment, and they prescribe a lot of opioids. Uh, so lots of activity here. I've also done some evaluations um, that we're just preparing them now for publication um, as to what are predictors of states uh, adopting these policies, and interestingly, we're finding that ideology doesn't have a lot to do with it. So Republicans, Democrats, governors, you know, legislatures, uh, and the citizen ideology doesn't make that much of a difference as to why states adopt these. It's actually the overdoses uh, that seems to be most predictive. Um, so it's really that that's getting the attention of everybody and is making legislatures really get busy um, in this area. Similarly to the adoption of policies, the features of these policies have been increasing in their comprehensiveness over time. So this just shows you one of the policies, prescription drug monitoring programs, which is one of the most complex of these policies. There's lots of different features states can choose from and lots of variation in the state policies. Uh, but you can see along a number of these dimensions, I'll highlight a few in yellow, is the um, prescriber registration requirement, which Michigan has one now. Um, in blue is the prescriber use requirement, or, or use mandate, we call those. Um, those have really increased from 2012 onward, um, and more and more states are adopting these, and we're actively evaluating them. Um, but as states think, you know, see what their neighbor's doing, as evidence comes out that this might be helping, um, more and more states are, are enacting stronger provisions of the laws that they already have. Um, this is a, the, some results, sorry if they're a little small, um, an evaluation that I led um, that looked at some of the early adopter states that had really strong PDMPs or prescription drug monitoring programs. The two states here shown in red are Kentucky and um, New Mexico. Uh, and we compared them to a comparator state that was neighboring and had other similar characteristics in terms of their prescribing uh, and found so in the bottom, the dotted line is the trajectory that would have happened if the, if the strong P PDMP hadn't been adopted. And the, the black is what actually happened, so that, that difference um, change afterwards. So essentially what that's showing is in mean opioid dosages, so the strength of the opioids that are prescribed, um, that it, it strongly decreased, or the, the trajectory really changed after this PDMP was put into place. Um, and we saw that along, you know, across multiple different states that we were looking at that had done this around the 2012-13 time frame. Uh, we saw the, the similar reductions in um, not just the dosages, but also the proportion of the population filling, um, also high-risk measures, things like um, polypharm, or we actually didn't look at polypharmacy in the study, but um, things like high opioid dosages, uh, things like pharmacy shopping and doctor shopping, so strong, uh, large relative reductions in all of those. So that all suggests that something about these strong programs is doing something to reduce prescribing. Um, and this evidence is really um, been supported by a number of different studies in different populations. In my study, we looked at the um, commercially insured, the privately insured population, but people have looked at the Medicaid populations, the Medicare populations, found similar results. Um, and so the strong features that are emerging from these studies are really having a use mandate that prescribers have to check the databases, having a registration mandate that prescribers have to register and be enrolled because you have to get a separate login for these systems, uh, and finally, that um, there's be delegate access allowed. Um, so the prescriber doesn't always have to be checking themselves. They can delegate that to a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, or other um, a person that is on their team uh, to do that check for them. Because there's always this, this administrative element of, of the, uh, getting these data. We've looked also at um, different state policies. I've done now a scoping review of what, what effects are these policies having. Um, the main message here is uh, 
there, most of these policies uh, are not showing large effects yet, um, but some of them, a few of them are on the prescribing front. So we already talked about PDMPs, uh, but those pain clinic laws I mentioned do seem to be reducing opioids prescribed and dosages dispensed. Um, also, the um, prescribing guidelines, particularly in e emergency medicine settings, um, seem to be having some effect at reducing prescribing. And finally, what do we call drug supply management? So these are things that reduce the supply of opioids prescribed either um, in dosages, in the number of, of pills, or uh, put some kind of barriers like prior authorization and those sorts of things uh, to getting the, the pills. Um, and there, really just the prior authorization is, suggest is showing um, some effects of reducing the opioids that, that um, people are prescribed and dispensed. Um, the acute, a lot, you hear a lot about these acute prescribing guidelines, and Michigan now has one for seven days, um, and there's some controversy around these, these policies. Chad has written about that um, uh, because they're a pretty blunt instrument. It's sort of every time you can only prescribe three, five, seven day supply. Those are pretty new laws, so we haven't had enough time to evaluate them. Uh, the main thrust of all these findings is a number, a handful of these policies are reducing prescribing, uh, including that which is high risk. Pretty much all of the policies do not have a do not have a strong evidence base as to what they do for overdoses. Um, so that's that more ultimate health outcome, um, and that we're also interested in. Uh, and some of that might be that it takes time for a lot of these policies to have that effect on on that ultimate outcome. Uh, you know, some of it may be that uh, you know that that they you know aren't infiltrating to the degree that we want them to. Um, and then some of it may be that, you know, this unintended consequence of some of these reductions in prescribing and to what effect is that shifting people to other illicit sources and, you know, sometimes which are more dangerous um, than prescription opioids. So we have to be really careful in how we target these, these policies um, and they're well-intentioned, but we don't want to have these other, other effects. So Michigan, uh, many of you may be familiar with this, uh, given um, that where we are, um, but just as a, a recap, um, Michigan was a little late to the game uh, in terms of um, enacting these strong policies, but now has really jumped on board. Um, the four big ones are uh, that acute pain uh, limit that we talked about, um, the seven-day supply limit, uh, the PDMP, which is called MAPS here, has a, both a use and a registration mandate when you're prescribing more than a three-day supply um, to a patient of controlled substances. Uh, there is a, needs to be a bona fide a prescriber-patient relationship um, in all of this opioid prescribing. Um, and that had a later implementation of, of January 4th of this year. Um, and then finally, there has to be informed consent um, when you're prescribing, including for children, um, to make sure, really those last two are making sure there's, there's you know, a fidelity and, and integrity of the physician-patient relationship that's going on. Uh, these are all really new, too new to really have evaluated, um, but uh, MAPS, and I think Kim Gadecki is, is in the room still, um, uh, has done some early uh, looks at what's happening. Uh, these are some of their a little bit older data, but uh, MAPS also uh, had a huge system upgrade uh, in late 2016 to early 2017. Um, so that does seem to be, this is showing you controlled substance prescribing, and it started, the, the uh, scales started to tip in 2016, where we finally saw a reduction in prescribing in this state, which was later than a lot of the rest of the country. Um, and so that may be attributable to that MAPS upgrade. Uh, we've also seen reductions in what we call this like doctor and pharmacy shopping uh, or multiple prescriber episodes when you're frequenting lots of patients or frequenting lots of uh, uh, pharmacies or physicians within a short period of time, uh, also associated with that um, MAPS upgrade. Um, I just heard uh, some of the mo most recent data in talking with um, Tim Gadecki that uh, since this use and registration mandate have gone into effect in this state that uh, registration, registrants with the MAP system have gone from, I believe it was about 11,000 to 44,000 and plus 17,000 delegates, so a huge increase. Uh, also that um, the checks to the system have dramatically increased over 50%, so it went from 500,000 monthly queries to the MAPS database to 1.2 to 1.3 million um, after June 1st uh, when that was implemented. So those are pretty significant increases. Um, we will want to obviously do more rigorous evaluations and compare it to controls and make sure that we think that this is attributable, I mean, that, that any changes in prescribing are attributable to um, that MAPS uh, change. Uh, but I do expect that we'll see similar things to what we've seen in other states, um, that the prescribing will go down, the high-risk prescribing will go down, 
but then we also need to be thinking about what other outcomes do we need to want to be thinking about along the trajectory of opioid harms. Um, so I will stop there and thank you very much and welcome your questions. Thank you, Rebecca. So we intentionally kept all the lectures fairly short with the hope that we could have some active discussion. And we know you have questions. We know you're working in this space. I will put out there as well, just um, for those that are uh, working on policy, you're introducing new policy, thinking about policy, or evaluating policies being introduced, and you want another view. Uh, we don't represent any of the major medical organizations. We are here to serve the state, and we would happily um, advise on those on those policies and be, be available if you ever have questions about this policy and how they might impact real care and how they might be received. So with that, I'd like to open up questions. Yes? So whenever I hear the word naivety, I think yeah. of education or lack thereof. Um, how often and how, how are we mobilizing providers particularly to provide options to patients so that they can know, I want to opt out of Norco, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and just take ibuprofen um, rather than kind of that fraternal patriarchal model that we've seen in medicine for many years where doctor knows best. Yeah. So that's a great question, which is, you know, just to repeat for those that didn't hear, how, how do we move from that model of doctor knows best to empowering patients to be part of their own decision making, understanding risk benefit and making that decision? I'll start and then I'll, you know, hear from the other providers here. So I guess um, from my perspective, that that's actually where we need a lot of help. I mean, I, I will say, um, if when we go to providers, one of the areas of pushback we get is, um, you know, through Big Pharma had hundreds of millions of dollars of funding to go into not only doctor's offices, but to the lay public and give the impression that opioids are effective and that they're safe. And that perception now, several, dec you know, three decades later exists, and it's going to be hard to move. So one of the areas, while I'll say, um, we've been received really well by surgeons and dentists, people excited to hear our message, wanting to hear what the right answer is, tell me how much to prescribe. Um, one of their pushback is, why am I the one that needs to re-educate this patient in this moment and in the era where we're being asked to see more patients in less time? And so um, I will say this is where uh, Nicole Rouge, wherever she is, her, her job is not only to take back pills, she's not only like the, um, the, the pill take back queen, but she also um, is helping us try to put together materials. And, and we look for partnership here, re-educating the lay audience and making sure that they walk in empowered is a critical piece. I will say where we have made strides is we've made pr patient brochures that talk about the importance of non-opioid analgesics, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, um, they go through that. But to your question of the patriarchal model, it still very much exists in medicine, and I don't have a perfect answer. Mike, uh, Ramesh, uh, any, any perspectives from the from a surgeon or from a dentist? I mean, I think I, I probably naively think the tide has turned. I think patients are more and more aware of the risk benefits of, kind of everything that we do. I think medicine is trying to turn its focus to uh, patient-centered and trying to listen, listen to patients better. It's hard. Um, our narrative is, uh, and your point around education is, it is the single most important aspect um, to try to kind of optimally take care of any patient um, around pain or any other problem. Our narrative now become the surgery at the University of Michigan and more and more across the state is surgery hurts. We are here to take care of you. We care about you and your pain care. Um, opioids are um, potentially part of your care, but they have a lot of complications and side effects. And, um, and here is what you should expect with your, let's say, hysterectomy. We're going to take out your uterus, you're going to be in the hospital a day, and you're, we're going to give you eight pills. Try not to take any, and here's exactly the plan on how we think optimal pain care should be. And we'll call you the next day and the day after. The problem is, as a healthcare provider, all of that takes time. So I'll applaud Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan, who is actually um, facilitating that time for providers so that they have more time um, and generate some revenue for best care. Uh, but I think to reiterate, though, I think your point is spot on. Um, I think most providers um, would agree. They just feel this, just like all of us, there's so much time in the day and 
something's going to fall by the wayside if I spend an extra five minutes with you uh, for this problem. But I do agree. Ramesh, do you have any thoughts from dentistry? You know, the only thing that I would add is that in medical and dental education, um, the curricular designers are interested in your question. So this obviously takes time for that to roll out into people who are practicing, but uh, dental and medical curriculum are changing to person-centric care, which is a step beyond patient-centered care. Starting to think about the social determinants of health and that sort of thing. So, uh, People are interested, but the implementation phase is challenging. I, I think what you're describing is the next stage, though. When people come in, and we are hearing it a little bit. Mike tells a story of a kid that had a young kid who had a liver transplant whose parents came up and said, just don't give any of that opioid stuff, right? So I, I think there's a balance there, though, right? We want to pe people to feel, uh, to, to, to be part of opioid stewardship, be part of their own care, and at the same time, um, not be fearful in cases where they actually do add value because we are probably also, while we're working to reduce prescribing in surgery and dentistry, we're also probably working in the few spaces where we think opioids are probably have good utility. I'm a chronic pain physician. We don't really, do, our work is not rooted in chronic pain, but I can say I struggle much more with respect to who is appropriate for opioids for long-term pain. That question's a lot muddier, right? And so empowering for this. A question back to me. Yes, sir. Are there any efforts to uh, ensure that the drug manufacturers are not uh, marketing in such a way as to encourage the overuse and to, to go upstream and attack that part of the problem? Um, yeah, I'll touch on this. So this is the question was around um, drug manufacturers and are any any efforts to stop them from marketing the medications upstream. You know, we're in an era right now where everybody and their cousin is also suing Purdue Pharma. And you know, all, we see this. This is lay press. I'm not describing anything that everybody doesn't know. Um, so, I, and, and really, branded pharmaceuticals make up a very small proportion of the overall opioid market right now. And we talk about surgery and dentistry. Everything that we prescribe is pennies on the dollar. Hydrocodone, oxycodone, all these are generic drugs. Now, there has been a lot of interesting lay press around the the um, third party distributors who have definitely been part of this. Um, I, I won't name names because uh, I, don't, I like my house and you know I want to want to keep it up. Uh, but I guess uh, there are third-party distributors that are actually lobbying at a, at a very direct level to uh, put up roadblocks for DEA to you know sort of be involved in determining an appropriate amount of opioids to go to a community. We've seen these stories from West Virginia where you know towns of 200 were getting tens of thousands of medications a week, you know, supplying a large region. Um, I don't think opioid companies right now, to my knowledge, are out there marketing opioids in the U.S. Um, in the way that they were. I think what's scarier for me is the writing on the wall is here for the U.S. that things are going to change for branded pharmaceuticals around the opioid space. And they're now moving out and doing international marketing. And, so, and in many ways going to countries that have less resource than we do. If we look at our communities that have been most, we have, we have both um, profound effects in, an urban, in ur urban settings, but also in our rural settings. It, it look, in, in the state of Michigan, our rural settings have been disproportionately affected. Urban settings definitely still had huge in, impact from opioids. Um, and so I really worry about these countries where resources are even less than what we have in, in, in our most affected communities. And so um, I will say, uh, when people say, what's the real solution, right? And this is not a practical solution, but if, if you look at it, pharmaceutical companies had hundreds of millions of dollars to go plant themselves in doctor's offices and te with pens and donuts. If you gave me hundreds of millions of dollars, which I will accept, we, we would go and we could. We could be, and this is the concept of academic detailing. The difference is when we do academic detailing, we're doing it in an academic way. We take a few health systems and we show that when you walk in and you teach a doctor or a dentist in person, hey, this is what I know about opioids, and you ask them to assess their own practice and reassess their own practice, it works really well. We did this in dentistry. We did this with Altarum as part of our SAMHSA uh, funding, and we did it at a small scale, and the, the effects were pretty profound. We just needed to be there face to face. So if you said, what, what is a practical solution but has a big dollar number behind it, it is that, that concept of effectively reversing what, what drug reps have possibly done. You put a donut down in the middle of a busy day, a couple of pens that say stop prescribing, and I, I think you could see profound effects. Whether that's practical and whether there's money behind that, 
That's the real question. Yes, in the back. Now we'll come to the side of the room next. Yes. This is all awesome work. Thank you for um, all the work you guys are doing on prescribing. I'm wondering on the um, other side of things, you mentioned kind of the unintended consequences of lowering prescribing once, you know, this large number of people have already become addicted. And I know that on the treatment side, there's some inadequacies there. And it seems like maybe there's some disconnect, too, between the recovery community and the medical community, because um, they're kind of in two different like groups of funding sources or whatever. But I'm just wondering if there are uh, policy initiatives devoted more on, or research devoted on the treatment side of things, um, if there's more treatment coming to kind of address this stuff. And then um, this might be really specific, but I know there are some regulations coming out through LARA that are gonna affect access to treatment in a negative way. And I don't know, my question is maybe for uh, Dr. Hapaji or Hapaji. Yeah, yeah. So really trying to dis distinguish uh, the the prescribing community from the treatment community and looking at policies and solutions around um, treatment and access to treatment and even some suggestion that there will be new licensing board uh, rules, which I'm, I'm not sure exactly what one we're talking about, that would potentially affect access to treatment. Do you know what? Are you talking about the administrative rules for the substance use facilities? Yeah. Those were enacted on December 17th. Okay. I, I know, but they are, uh, I know, so the, the area that I represent, it's going to, on more rural recovery programs, it's going to have the potential of shutting down a lot of programs because there are more rigorous requirements in a field that is, I mean, this may not be the specialty here, but I'm just wondering, you know, if you, if you have any insight on the, the efforts policy-wise to address treatment specifically, which can be, you know, more expensive, admittedly, so maybe harder to... Yeah. Solve. Yeah, I do do some research on the treatment side as well. So, um, so a lot more of the treatment regulation in, uh, happens at the federal level. Actually, um, there are requirements for methadone clinics. There are buprenorphine waivers that have to be um, obtained by providers who are prescribing that treatment. You know, it's been pointed out that there's a dissonance between that, you know, how heavily regulated that is and how easy it is to prescribe opioids, um, and especially given that buprenorphine, for example, is not as addictive as, a, it does have an opioid component, but it's not as addictive as your hydrocodone or oxycodone. Um, so there's lots of activities, and there's some things in the federal legislation, like the CARA Act um, and the Supports Act that are trying to um, loosen some of those regulations, or mainly to make more prescribers able to per to prescribe buprenorphine and um, and make these uh, these these waivers more readily available. Um, there is are also lots of funding that's coming from the federal government to the states, and then states are really deciding how to allocate that funding. A lot of it has to do with treatment. Um, so, but I will say I think our the funding uh, still is vastly below what it needs to be, um, and Michigan actually is. Uh, there's been one report, it's a, it's a few years old now, but um, compared kind of states in terms of their overdose rates and their treatment providers and, and buprenorphine capacity, and Michigan was one of the worst. Um, it had the biggest divide there, uh, and particularly in a lot of our rural counties and rural areas where there is no provider whatsoever. Um, so from, I study a little bit, the, I think well, to me one of the biggest issues is the workforce, um, is how do we get people to provide these medications and to these areas? Um, what incentives could we provide to get some a psychiatrist or an addiction specialist or someone to actually go want to practice in those areas? Um, and so I think the, like the federal government could do a lot in terms of loan repayments or incentives to try to get folks to want to practice in those areas. I think there's also been some action on telemedicine as well and trying to um, loosen some of the federal Ryan Hate Act requirements and then um, there's some state law barriers as well um, in terms of scope of practice and what people can can practice um, and then if you're a telemedicine provider in another area you have the addiction specialty uh, special uh, specialist um, in, uh, intel and you're providing remotely um, you know having to be licensed in that other state and and that other state might restrict whether you can use telemedicine to prescribe controlled substances so there's a lot of kind of thorny issues that need to be worked out. You know, I think it's easy for the Trump administration to say telemedicine is a huge 
goal, a huge answer to our opioid crisis, but logistically and legally, there's a lot of um, pieces that need to be worked out, and it's starting. Um, and I think there's great, there is great potential there. It's just, um, it's going to be some time, I think, before that's a main modality uh, for um, for treatment. Um, so that, those are some thoughts of mine. Questions from this side of the room? Yes, sir. <coughs> I'm glad you're um, touching on some of the economic and political issues in this problem. Uh, we also should keep in mind that where we get opium, the poppy seeds, largest production of poppy seeds is Afghanistan. We have a whole army over there hanging around, probably protecting one way or the other the uh, opium. And we've had over the years, you know, try to kill off the poppy seeds and then they come back and we get into all of the other political issues involved. It's kind of sad, but uh, you're touching uh, the economics, the producers, and the politics involved in all that. So even though you can reduce maybe prescribing it, kind of kill the market a little bit, you're still going to have to deal with that. I was just in Australia last week. Tasmania makes a lot of opium. <laughs> so it's not just Afghanistan. They actually, Tasmania grows a ton of poppy. Yeah. Chad, I have a question. Um, so from, uh, Rebecca kind of talked about the legislation that passed in the last two years. And uh, what would you say are, for the next couple of years in this administration, what are the two or three big issues that the legislature and the administration can focus on. Of course, as you and I know from our relationship of working on data, and unfortunately Kim left, um, I know there's some work there, but what are, what are a couple of those key issues? Yeah, thanks for that question. So what are the key issues that we think we can still work on? Um, I believe that we, we've shown at least in, in our prescribing efforts, because I do believe this is still a prescribing issue at its root, there's no question that we need more funding for medication assisted treatment, more access to care. But if we really want a 20 year view here, we still need to keep focus on prescribing because we're still creating new users. We're still spilling pills into our community. I actually don't buy into the narrative that because we've reduced, we've pushed people to heroin. I think that meds are still there. Um, I, th I think that, that that's a narrative that's sort of a false narrative right now. But I believe that if we can still continue to focus on providers talking to providers, policy has a role, there's no doubt about it, but, but continuing to fund groups like ours and others to have p providers talk to providers, a 50% reduction in prescribing across, I think it was about 11,000 patients we looked at um, over a course of one year, that's a shocking difference. And yet doing so in a patient-centered way that, that keeps pain appropriate and, and, and satisfaction there. We do also need to think about how we access data. Um, right now we have too many restrictions around how we share data and data for good use. I understand there's a sensitivity around this. I understand patients don't want their data out there, but there are ways, um, sensitive ways to share this prescription data to allow us to do better quality improvement and, under, and do better research. And I think anything we can do to continue to look at the fact that we have now the MAP system, which is refreshed three times a day, available and really underutilized. And there are other states that don't put the restrictions around use of MAPS data, and those states are advancing their knowledge of what's happening in their state. We have to think about removing some of those barriers to make access. I mean, you're, you're sitting here, you're, we're talking to one of the world's experts of PDMPs, and yet we're still kind of lagging behind. She's using, she's using national data sets instead of our state's data, and we're moving towards the point where we'll be able to use the state's data, but we need to take yet another step. And we're actually really proud to be partnered with um, Kim Gatica in her office and using that data to understand not just what's happening in prescribing, but we're actually going to be doing precision health, looking at genetic factors associated with people who go down the path of dependence to try to understand the biology of dependence and addiction. Because I, I think that's the point is we want to continue to take, look, we don't, we don't want to take advantage of an epidemic. That's not why we're here. We need to take advantage of the fact that we have this attention now to think about how we handle data, how we share data, and how we improve our understanding of health and wellness um, so that we, when this next problem comes up, we're a little bit more knowledgeable and we're a little bit more nimble. Other suggestions, comments? 
Yeah, I, I do think that um, more can be done at every level, but on some of the social determinants as well of this um, issue, and um, and not sort of so how do why do some people become addicted and some don't, and and what social factors are playing into that. And, there's more and more research uh, moving in that direction. Um, and so thinking about providing life supports at that stage, but also with the MAT, with the treatment. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't get, you know, if, if somebody sort of has, is, is effectively managing their addiction, but they don't have any employment opportunities, they don't have, you know, help to, you know, care for their children, um, those sorts of things, then it's very much easier to fall back into that pattern and, and lifestyle. So housing, another thing that we hear a lot of people, if I'm still hanging around and living with the same people that I was misusing with, then how am I, even if I have my treatment, I'm probably going to fall back into that. So really thinking about funneling more money into some of those like social programs, I think, and linking them specifically to opioids is really important. Yes. I believe it was like in 2013, I take the mini med classes that happen out of here, and there was a doctor of psychology who said, I don't forget his name, but he was on, his specialty was chronic pain. And he had a study, he said, and he, he's been on every board of the pain people, and he told them all, your pain stuff doesn't work. What works? <coughs> Cannabis. This is before it became illegal, okay? But a research project out of U of M um, was talking about cannabis and its potential for pain relief, but the politicians and the providers wouldn't allow it. My question is, uh, where are we? I know we're into drugs, but are we into the possibilities that that which they try to keep illegal in a lot of respects has a potential that you wouldn't get opium? I know you're grinning. So well, I'm grinning because this is good. This is a hard question. I, 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 we, we get it a lot, so I'm, I'm happy to receive it. But I'm, I'm only grinning because these are hard questions. But please, finish your question. Well, my question is, is there any research other than, because the drug companies provide the doctors with all their research. And the one thing I've learned with dealing with the different universities is everybody's interested in their research grant. That's all they're interested in more than is how much money am I going to get to study the toenail? All right. My question is, are they going to open up to the possibilities other than the opiate people, or not the, op the opiate people and the drug companies fund them, or are they only going to go with people who fund them and maybe possibilities that something else that isn't going to kill them would work? Sure. So I, I guess the question is, how are we going to, are, are we going to do better studies of, of, of medical cannabis? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so our group, our broader group, um, so we, we have a couple in our group who are, are interested in cannabis as a medication for pain. Um, Do you research, my question would be, does this researcher talk to that researcher? Because this is the one thing working, I'm a holistic practitioner, all right? The one thing I learned through my studies is this room doesn't talk to that room, and, and th this one doesn't know what that one's doing. Uh, all right, so why don't you guys have a symposium where you get everybody together as opposed to you doing the ear and you doing the nose and you doing the... Yeah, that's a great point. That's actually one of the reasons that... I'm, so I'm a Hoosier transplant, and one of the reasons I'm hard to move right now is because I'm so proud of the collaboration and the connection at the University of Michigan. Um, we actually have a naturopath in our group who does work on acupressure. We have uh, six behavioralists who are doing work on all sorts of behavioral aspects, not just addressing negative affect, but also thinking about enhancing wellness and resilience. Um, we have groups that are working on cannabis, and we are actually all integrated as one network, all working together. We write collaborative grants. On Friday, the NIH will be here uh, evaluating it. University of Michigan as one of three potential sites for this new HEAL money that w is really intended to do that as a partnership with the state. There'll be several, there may have been from today's audience in that crowd today, but this will be um, taking different approaches, some public health approaches, behavioral approaches, medication, physician to physician, and bringing them in as one. You are right, there is, there, 
there, there are silos in research as there are silos in any industry. In your own school. Agree, and that's why. I mean, did you guys ever look at what other professors have come up with? Or do you go looking for new because you get paid for that? That's a good question. I mean, yeah, we, we, we do collaborate, and we, I understand your point. I, I'd say we're connected, and I think things are going really well, and we are. I think we do have a good ecosystem of people who share knowledge, and uh, certainly we'd be open to any suggestions you might have as to other things that we might want to consider. Appreciate your comment. Biofeedback, biofeedback we do. We, we, we love biofeedback. It's a, it's a very helpful thing. Other questions? On that, we should just um, plug our, we do have an a opioid solutions network across the University of Michigan, and the, I believe the um, URL is opioidsolutions.org, um, or maybe .edu, uh, but it is uh, hundreds of researchers across the university who are working on different facets of the opioid epidemic, or you know, some are more tangential and doing things that relate to it somehow, um, and it's a group, and so we have a, we have forum that where we come together, we have a website, uh, we have ways to contact each other. Um, so if we're not working directly with somebody, um, then that it was, you know, it was very emblematic of University of Michigan in trying to create these kind of cross-cutting groups that bring people together that have great, and one of the great things about Michigan is we have so many great schools um, and so many great experts, but you're right, it's that you need to have those cross-cutting features to be able to know what everybody else is working on. I think we may have time for one more question. Yes. Uh, again, I wanted to uh, um, offer my appreciation to the University of Michigan for bringing this even together. And listening to what you were saying, the amount of energy and dedication that's being put on it is very hopeful for the changes to occur. Hearing about the dental industry, absolutely. I'm old enough to have had my scar tissue uh, operation in the 50s with ether. I'm old enough to have had the dental work where we just went home and had analgesics and told put a hot tea bag in your mouth. I'm old enough to have been in an office and watched a nurse knock on the door and tell my doctor that Mr. So-and-so would like to take this drug and have that doctor say, okay, but her look at me that chose to do homeopathics and say, I don't know what to do with you. I'm old enough to have gone through all these things and had a surgery I am that model where I've never taken anything. But I, in order to have, when you have a knee surgery, you have to not have pain to have physical therapy. I told my doctor on operation day, do not give me anything that will control my mind. He did a very good job. I extended my physical therapy for two months. I, of course, wasn't taking oxycodone because I knew what that was. At the end of two months, when I felt better, I said, I'm gonna go off of this. I have enough of a, a training and an education to think I could have gone off of that. It probably was some kind of an opioid. What happens is your nervous system starts to take over and you feel like you're separated. And what started to happen after about five hours is I started to get very nervous because we're an electrical system. I don't know what was reacting. Way into the evening, I found myself trying to say, I'll go lay down. And I literally found myself uncontrollably moving. Left, right, right, left. I was separated to say, what the heck's going on? Because I was unaware of what I was taking. About three in the morning, where I'm right to the edge of, I'm gonna go back and get one of those. I just said, I'm gonna stick it out till that I see that sunlight. And I made it through it. And then I realized no one told me how to wean off of it. And I hear you accept that it's a prescription with doctor's issue, but it is not because you are being provided a certain model of what to use. In your profession, you're just trying to do the best for your patients. What I'm hearing while you're gathering this information is to try to understand the power you have in your voices to influence the pharmaceuticals to go find another version of a medication that does not affect and addict people. And I would like to see them put in their paperwork, how to wean people off of it. Sure, that's fair. fair point. Thank you for that. Well, thank you so much for your attention today. We really appreciate the turnout. You've been a great group. Please reach out to us if, uh, if we can be a help.
Dr. Grummet, and thanking all of you for being a part of this very stimulating discussion today. And a special thanks to Dr. Nalia, Inglesby, and Puffaji for bringing us such varied insights on this very important issue and helping with the root causes of opioid epidemics, um, not only in Michigan, but across the nation, correct? So on behalf of the Wolverine Caucus, I'd like to present you this gold Wolverine Caucus pen. And we certainly appreciate everything that you've done to share with us today. And we will share your information continually with everyone here. If you'd like the PowerPoint, please let us know. And also, we will have it available on public access television very soon and online, the University of Michigan. And also, I wanted to especially thank Leo Katari. It was Leo at M Open who invited our panel today. So, Leo, may we give you a gift of appreciation? Hi. Thank you. So, we wish you a good afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you all again on March 19th, that's Tuesday, March 19th, when we will have a group here from University of Michigan talking about helping older adults. Thank you, have a good day.